Howdy y'all, welcome back to Little Bits. Today we're gonna talk a little bit about programming the small computer central computers using this here, our colorful red, white, and blue single board computer, eight bit motherboard. I love this computer, this is the SC720. It's got a lot of the features of the other computers that I've been working with except it's all in one package and I really like it. It's got ROM WBW and it's got small computer monitor, so we'll use both and let's get started. Today I'm going to teach you how to work in both assembly and C language using Z80 ASM by SLR and using high tech C, which I forget who created that, but uh, we'll cover that a little later. All right, let's get started. As you can see, I have a real-time clock and a PIO module installed on this board. And I have the PIO module port A hooked up to these lights. And we're going to try and blink these lights from both assembly and C. All right, so here we go. We're going to start with a clarification from a previous video. So I'm going to go to Small Computer Central documentation actually let's go to projects this is also documentation uh, we want to look at the small computer monitor version 1.3 and we want to go look at the user guide all right now there's a mistake I made in my last video where I was like I was looking at some assembly language code examples thinking that they were the examples of how to enter code into the memory editor, and I was wrong about that. So the memory editor works in a way that I did not read about before I started trying to use it. Uh, one note here that we need to make sure of is that in order to input ASCII characters, we precede it with a quotation mark, but we don't follow it up with another quotation mark. As soon as we hit enter, it'll start allowing us to input data again. So if I boot up into small computer monitor and I edit the memory like I did in my last video where I did a hello world, not my last video, but a recent one where I did a hello world in small computer monitor, uh, we can do that example again. So to do that example again, what we want to do is make sure we're <laughs> looking at the right documentation i'm going to pull up this reference sheet to make sure i know which api functions to call all right so what we want here is we want to load the api function that we want which is to print a string and then reset to 30 hex and that will cause this function to execute and as long as we have the stuff in the right places when we do it it will print the stuff so what we're looking at right now is there's output character there's output line so we want function call number six so what we're gonna do is we're gonna load up the assembler we're gonna start on 8,000 oops that was wrong we're gonna start on 8,000 hex all right and then we're gonna say load C uh, we want which one we want 06 output line right output line okay so 06 we want to load DE and it doesn't matter if it's upper or lowercase um, I tend to just put it in caps lock when I'm doing this but then I'll, I'll do a shift and end up with lowercase letters so it doesn't really matter uh, in this particular system so we want to load DE with, let's put our data in hex 9,000. And then we want to jump to hex 30. And then we want to return. Now we just need to put our data in 9,000 and we will use the editor. And just like last time, we're gonna to go to 9,000 and we're just gonna put in hello, oops, see, hello world. See, we don't need this closing or this closing um, quotation mark. But if I did put it, boop, and I wanted to remove it, I can use this character to go back one space and then enter 
nothing instead. Um, so if I wanted to go back multiple spaces and change that, I can use the caret character multiple times to go backwards and modify what I put into the memory. If you hit dot and enter, it'll exit. You can also just hit escape. Now we should be able to go to 8,000 and have it print hello world. Hello world. Now it, <laughs> it gave me a bunch of stuff after that. So uh, that's probably because, oh, and you can see it even included my, so it did not accept uh, my entry of a blank line as a replacement for this closing character. And probably this is because the rest of the um, memory has kind of junk in it afterwards. So that's why sometimes, a lot of times I will do a fill before I even do this kind of thing. So if I wanted to do fill 9,000 uh, with zero, actually how does fill work? Let's double check. Cause I've been using multiple operating systems at this point and Okay, so we want start, end, and the byte to fill it with. So we'll do fill 9000 to 9100, zero. That should give us, that should give us uh, something better to work with. So then let's go ahead and put that data back into 9000 because we definitely overwrote it. Hello world. All right, this time we're not going to put that closing parenthesis. We're going to, oops. Okay, we're going to go back one. And we're going to put a zero. Um, now we're going to exit. That was a typo. All right, now let's go to 8,000 again and see what happens. Hello world! This time it doesn't print any junk, and we didn't include that that trailing. Now, uh, also, I believe um, this particular system, we can do edit 9,000, hello world, enter, and then 05, I believe to print a new line and that's just something that small computer monitor knows how to do so let's try that again yeah see we got a new line this time you can see that up here when we did it the prompt ended at the end of the line this time we got a new line so the prompt is on a new line itself um, but there you go that's a little clarification i was misunderstanding how the um, quotation mark worked uh, how the editor worked how to actually control it this is there is no mistake in how this works this is the correct way that it works this is the expected behavior so now we'll go ahead and move on to using cpm using assembly language in the cpm operating system so i'm going to turn the computer off i'm going to switch over to the other rom which is just a flip switch on this particular machine turn it back on and here we go, we see, C we see uh, ROM WBW booting up. Now I actually don't use CPM. If we look at the list of ROMs available, we have CPM 2.2, but we also have Z system. Now I use Z system mostly. Uh, CPM 2.2 is lacking some features that Z system has. This is a CPM clone, so it's still CPM. Most CPM op uh, applications will run in it. Uh, the ones that we need run in it just fine. So uh, actually I booted into this, I've installed it on a flash or on my compact flash card, which is this one here. And uh, I'm gonna boot into that. So there we go. Compact flash is booted up. You can see I have some drives in my path so that I don't have to refer to programs by name. This is actually important for something later. And then I'm, I'm setting up the um, date and time stamping stuff. So now that uh, LDDS is loaded, which is date stamps, something load date stamps, um, presumably I can like look at the calendar and stuff. You know, it doesn't show me exactly what day is. It doesn't highlight the day, but it only knows that it's this month because it's using the real time clock and because this is loaded. Now this comes with the system. So it's, it's just on the, it's on the, ROM WBW system by default. Um, you do have to set up the date stamps with a put date stamp tool. Uh, I've already done that, so I'm not gonna run it again. But that's a little aside, that's besides the point. So what we want to do now is we want to, we want to find an assembler and ROM WBW comes with an assembler, but it's the original CPM 2.2 assembler and 
That thing does not understand Z80 syntax. It understands 8080 syntax. So if you want to write in Z80 syntax, you need something different. And in this case, we're going to use SLRs, which I forget what SLR stands for. It's the company's name, Z80 ASM. You can see I've already searched for it a bunch. Now this computer here has it, but this, or this system here has it, or this website here has it, this website here has it. Um, actually, this is just documentation. This is the formal documentation, but uh, DRAMP has it. Now this is the full tool chain, okay? So you can use this config command to configure the Z80 ASM command to do some things um, such as searching for source code in a different user's directory. Uh, I don't really bother with that. Uh, the main tool we need is this Z80 ASM. The doc is useful. Make sim. I'm not sure what this does, but it's part of the tool chain. Uh, and then the dump tool here is actually provided in multiple formats, including the source code. Uh, 8080 Mac, I'm not sure what that does, but this is the whole tool chain. Like all these together consider the tool chain. This dump replaces the dump command that comes with ROMWW and it's a little bit better, but it also serves as an example code base because you can see here that this is the source code for it. Now, Z80 ASM always expects a .z80 at the end of the file. It will not even attempt to compile something that doesn't have a .z80 at the end of the file. So if you've ever seen that, that's where that comes from. This is a standard requirement for Z80 ASM it doesn't look at .asm files, it will ignore them. All right, so let's go ahead and download a copy. I actually have my copies downloaded. So let's not download a copy, but normally what I would do is I would download all of these and put them into a place where I can get at them and then I can upload them. Um, another tool we wanna look for is the High Tech C, C compiler, High Tech C on GitHub. Now this is an old C compiler that's still maintained to this day. It hasn't had a lot of changes or updates. It's not seeing any major revisions or anything, but this has changes, you know, as recently as last month here. Uh, last time I looked at it, it was two weeks ago. They were two week old changes in this code base. So this is a C compiler that is still under active maintenance for CPM today. And it's really, really good. Uh, it, it handles a lot of stuff. Now, if we want to get the files, we can, if we don't want to like deal with the source code, we can just get the files here. This is an LBR library. It's a type of archive file that was popular on CPM for, it doesn't do any compression, although it can, later revisions can do compression, but this one is an uncompressed archive of multiple files. And it just makes it easy to distribute files to CPM. So we'll download a copy of that. And of course, I already have a copy downloaded, so I'm not gonna do that. But this LBR file is what we'll transfer onto our system and we will use an included to tool, an included tool called NULU, N-U-L-U, to de-archive these files and actually get them up and running. So if I want to send stuff to my system, of course, I want to use the X modem and you can see this little exclamation, exclamation, exclamation time. This is a file required in order to do date stamping on these files. So as I add files to this thing, this file will get updated with date stamps uh, for each file. So that's, that's why that file is there. First, we're going to send files over. So we want our Z80 ASM dot arc. Now I've built an archive up. Oops, XM, R, Z80, ASM. I've built an archive up using the AR uh, command on Linux that allowed me to just generate an archive and then I, I can unarchive it uh, later. I have all my stuff in small computer monitor and Here's my Z80 ASM directory. And there should be an archive in here, Z80 ASM.arc. Now, I, like I said, I prepared that archive myself. Uh, it's a very simple command. It's AR, 
the letter A to add stuff, you name the file and then you add, you just give it a list of files that you want to add. And um, I'm not going to demonstrate that because it's extremely simple, but if you need help with it, let me know <laughs> in the comments. Speaking of which, please do check out my Patreon in the comment section and uh, give a like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. Uh, I'm a little underemployed right now, so anything you can pitch in will keep me making content, keep my bills paid. I appreciate y'all watching for sure. Absolutely. So uh, if you if all you can do is watch, um, just keep watching. I really I really enjoy the fact that y'all are learning with me. All right, so the upload's done. We can unarchive it now. Now you'll see that I have, um, oops, yeah, I changed the directory. See, this directory contains kind of the bulk of my tools and you'll see that I have a, an unarch tool in here. So if I go back to A, I can unarchive this archive, z80asm.arc to A. I want it to live in A. You can see I've archived the entire tool chain that we saw on the download page over here at dramp.com. Now dramp.com is a vintage computing site. They, have, they host a lot of software and this is just one of the things they host. But they have multiple things. Um, this is the thing we care about now. All right, so that's done. Now we want to copy over uh, our C compiler. Now I like to put the C compiler in J uh, just because it's my last drive. It's right there, it's kind of empty. Um, it's unlikely I'll use it. And I just put J in my path along with A and C and I can access any of these tools from any of my other drives without using a uh, direct absolute path using the drive letter. So now we want to XM our, and you can see I'm just calling XM. I'm not calling C XM, which is what I would normally have to do if I didn't have pathing, which is a powerful feature on Z system. And it, it does matter because when we install this C compiler, what's gonna happen is we're going to uh, be calling the C compiler from another drive and it's going to be calling other tools in that compiler tool chain from the other drive. And if those, if those tools are not inside of your path, then it's not gonna find them. It's gonna give you an error. Oh, I can't run the exec command, for example. And when it does that, it's just gonna fail. So what you have to do is you have to put all your source code in the same directory as your compiler, and that can just be a mess. And I don't wanna do that. So I'm using Z system specifically for that reason. So now we want our um, high tech C, high tech C bin dot library. Okay, so we're gonna transfer high tech C now, S, X modem. I also have high tech C in here. This is just a clone of the repository. Um, and then I also have, this is loaded up into the repository. You can just, this is just in the repository. This is the binary distribution. You can also see there's a Z280 bin. Uh, that is for Z280, which is no longer made, so we're not using it. Um, there we go. It's gonna start soon. You can see we have 3,833 blocks to transfer. This first count is the blocks. The second count is the actual size in kilobytes, as you can see. So that took a fair amount of time, and you can see it's quite a big file for such a small computer. It's nearly half a megabyte, and uh, given that each of these drives is a little over seven megabytes of space, you know that's that's pretty substantial. But we see it here now, and we want to extract it. So we're going to run Nulu, and we're going to tell Nulu to open hccbin.lbr. Now, Nulu is an interactive command, so it's going to put you in a prompt. Uh, it's very easy to use, though. You can type dash "-h", to get a help, and this tells you everything you need to know. Now, we only need to extract and exit, so we're going to do E, and we want to exit, and we want to extract to J. It's going to extract all the contents. Now, these are uncompressed, so this archive format is just a matter of grouping files together for ease of distribution, which makes things really easy on the Z80 computers that we're running. 
because normally with CPM you would have to transfer each file individually, but just being able to make a little archive and, and throw it on there really uh, saves a lot of time. And you'll see here we have our C309 command. Uh, I believe this C309-17 command is actually exactly the same, but uh, I'm a little unclear on that. I only use this command. libc is the standard library. libf is an optional floating point library that you use instead of libc. libover is a overlay library. I'm not sure what it's used for. I just know that it, it has something to do with overlays, uh, presumably for um, supporting 8080, I assume. Link has been renamed to link with a Q in order to uh, prevent naming collisions with the standard link utility normally included with ROM WVW and other CPM distributions. Uh, it's still the linker. Uh, in the past, it was named link with a K. This particular version has changed that uh, just for convenience's sake. And I don't know what quite all of these do yet, but I am learning this compiler. The documentation is very, very thorough. So, you know, I, it's it, everything that you need to learn this compiler uh, lives in this code base. All right, so we're done. So now we get to exit. Now let's make sure we know what exit is. It's dash X. Okay. And that closes the file as well because uh, Nulu opened the file. You can also run Nulu by itself without anything, and one of the commands you can do is uh, open. So if we wanted to open it, we could say cc bin.lbr, and it'll open it, right? So, uh, and then we can list the members, but we want to close it, and we want to exit, so we can see our files here. And if we want to check how much space is left on any drives we've interacted with, we can run the stat command. Now you'll see C has only 22K available, and that is because C is a ROM device. It's a read-only memory, and it is the ROM device on which the bulk of the ROM WBW tools live. And it's pretty full. It's 512K and there are 22K left on it. Now I've customized what's on there and I'll show how to do that in another video. So I have a different amount of space than you might see on a default install left. But the fact of the matter is that I can't write to this space anyway. This is read only. Uh, it's where tools live that I need, like Nulu, for example, or Stat, for example. Now Stat will only show you drives that you've interacted with so far in this particular login session. So if you haven't, if you if there's drives here that you don't see and you want to see what they look like, uh, what's left in them, you need to change directory into them or do a dir on them. And then when you do stat, it'll show you all those directories that you've interacted with since you booted up. All right, so that's a little aside as well. Uh, just some basic operations. Now we can actually start using these programs. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to do two Hello World examples and then we're going to do two Blinky Light examples. We're going to do Hello World in Assembly, we're going to do Hello World in C, and then we're going to do a light blinking, just a counter. It's just going to count up from uh, 1 to 255 in hexadecimal on some lights and then in C we're just going to turn some lights on because I don't have a sleep function in C right now and I need to write it myself so uh, I haven't done that yet and um, I don't want to try and do blinky examples from C without a delay function because the lights will just blink too fast it'll just look like a solid on so we'll just turn the lights on maybe back off from C and show how that works it's going to be extremely simple it's a lot simpler than you would think and I'll point you to the documentation you need at the end of this to dig into it yourself and write something a little more interesting than just blinky lights. Now the lights we're blinking, we're gonna blink through a PIO, a programmable IO interface module. So uh, it's parallel 
I.O. or pro programmable I.O. You can use it for both. Um, you can program it. It's basically GPIO pins for the Z80. I have two ports, each of which has eight pins and a couple of uh, status pins that can be used as well. And I am going to use that device to interact with our lights. All right, getting started shortly. Okay, so for our assembly language example, we're gonna work from our D drive. We're gonna work from our D drive for both of these, but for our assembly language example, what we're going to do is very similar to what we just did in Small Computer Monitor, except we're gonna use the Ed Editor to create a file called LED Count. Dot Z80. Now remember it has to have a dot Z80. Operating Ed is its own thing. I've sort of learned how to do it. Um, I can handle it pretty well at this point, but uh, I'm not going to cover how to do it here. Just know that I am going to create a text file with Ed. Uh, if you want, leave a comment. Maybe I'll do a full overview of how to use Ed. Uh, I'm not an expert on it yet, but I probably will be pretty soon. So. Uh, maybe if, if there's enough demand for it, I can make a video on how to actually operate Ed. Um, I won't be going into macros and things like that because I don't know how to do that, but maybe by the time I make it, I will. So point is, we're going to create this file. We want to use pretty standard um, assembly language constructs here. In this particular one, a uh, capital H at the end means it's a hexadecimal number. Uh, you can't use the standard, uh, like this is not a hexadecimal number. It won't be recognized. It'll kind of just be ignored. So you need to use that H. If you're starting a hexadecimal number that starts with a letter, you need to put a, put a zero in front of it before you put the letter or else it will be seen as a label or a symbol of some kind. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much exactly what you'd expect. Now, in this case, we're doing the same kind of thing. We're going we're gonna to make a BDOS call, an operating system call, to actually print a string. And that string is going to be hello world, just like before. Uh, in this case, we need to load C with uh, the parameter we want to, or with the function we want to call, which in this case is not going to be 06. It's going to be 09, I believe, right string. Now, write string expects a string that ends in a dollar sign. And if you don't have this dollar sign, it won't think of it. It won't realize it's the end of the string. And you cannot put a dollar sign in the, in the string that you want to print because it will see it as an end of string. So there's a limitation there. <laughs> but we do want nine hex. That's where we want to jump to, or that's what our function is. We want to load DE with our data. Now, in this case, we're not going to load a data location and then go and edit the memory like we did. We have a full operating system here and a full, or a full relocating assembler here. So we just need a label later on that tells us what this data is. So we're going we're gonna to make a data label, and then we're going to jump to instead of what CP or what small computer monitor uses, we're gonna jump to five, right? In the last case, we jumped to hex 30. In this case, we're jumping to hex or decimal five. Right, okay. And then we wanna return. And that's just about it. We still need our data. So we're gonna put a label here. We're gonna label it data. We're gonna define a byte. And that byte is going to be hello world. Now we can find further bytes after this. Uh, we want a new line, line feed. I think it has to be a capital H for hex. I could be wrong. I know if you're doing binary, it has to be a capital B. You can't do a lowercase b, but uh, you might be able to do a lowercase h for hex. All right, and that looks good to me. So we're gonna save the file, make sure it has what we think it has in it. 
There we go. All right, now we're gonna compile it. Z80 ASM LED count. Now you leave the file extension off because it's gonna look for this .z80 file. And it's already done. Um, and now we can run it. I, I know I named it LED count instead of hello world. And then we did a hello world. That was a mistake. But uh, we're going to call it Hello World. Yay. All right. Okay. So next up, we want to do the same example in C. And this time, let's actually name our example correctly instead of... Uh, I got a little ahead of myself there on the LED count naming there. So uh, let's actually name this one Hello. Now, this one's going to look really familiar to a lot of you. Uh, we need, it, it's just a standard C hello world. So we need to include stdio.h and then we need to have a main. Actually, let's do a void main because it doesn't matter what we return to the operating system. Uh, it's not a Linux, so it's, okay. I'm gonna close that out. We're gonna do minus one. We're gonna insert more lines. And then we're gonna say print f Hello world and a new line. Print out what we have. It's that simple. That's that's the hello world example. It's exactly what you would expect from C. All right. So we want to save that. And then we can do C309. Uh, previous versions just called this command C. For whatever reason, this version has its version in the name. Uh, you could probably change the name to C, but I don't just in case. So then we want to do hello. And in this case, we do tell it the full file name. Now, this is going to take a little while. It is adding some boilerplate. Uh, the, the binary executable that this is going to create is actually quite large, it's 15 kilobytes for for a hello world example. Uh, but if you examine that, you can see that there's a, a fair amount of boilerplate that probably won't change from program to program. A good amount of that 15K is gonna be uh, the same, I think, no matter what you're compiling. So if you get into bigger programs, they'll probably be bigger than, a, than an equivalent assembly language program, but uh, not necessarily by as much as you would expect just by looking at this one example you see it's still going it's taking its time um, there we go all right now we can do hello boom hello world and we get a new line uh to me it seems like the other hello world was a little bit faster um no i can't tell the difference so yeah there you go uh, that's the hello worlds. Now I'm going to do the LED examples off screen and then step through the code just because I don't want to sit here and fumble and waste your time on a more complex example. So we'll come back here momentarily. Okay, so we've got LED count written and it is actually the correct thing. Let's take a look at what's in it. This is the whole file. I tried to use some kind of best practices here by actually naming uh, what I'm working on with labels and using the equals directive in order to set them correctly um, instead of just doing kind of magic numbers in, <laughs> in the rest of the code. So we have some labels here. We start at org 0100. This org 0100 hexadecimal is where the TPA starts, the trans transient program area i think it's called uh the place where cpm will begin executing code and begin using ram to execute code so uh, anything that you write you typically want to start it at uh, 0100 for cpm the pio base is this address which is the same as port a's data Port B's control is plus two, or port A's control is plus two. You'll notice I didn't define port B. That's because we don't have port B hooked up. I had no reason to define port B in this code. But if I was writing code that needed to take advantage of one, the other, or both, I would want also port B data and port B control in here. 
which port B data is base plus one and port B control is base plus three. All right, so uh, here we have um, output mode. This is, I happen to know based on the data sheet for the PIO that if you tell port A or port B uh, OF that you are going into output mode. So we want to first set output mode by loading it into A and outputting it to the control port. That tells port A that anything you, I send to data, I want to output. I'm not reading it as input. I'm just sending. I'm just sending it as output. So we load one, and send that out to output, and that will start the count. All right. Now we're going to start looping. Okay. So we're going to count up. We're going to count all the way up to OFF, which is 255 decimal. Right. So we're going to increment A. We're going to output again. Now there's probably more efficient ways we could have done this little bit of code to where more of it ended up inside. We didn't repeat as much of it because you can see these are exact repeats of one another. But uh, I am not going to bother to refactor this. I just wanted to kind of get an example out real quick. And it, it may be harder than I think in assembly language to do that. Um, so uh, I'll look into that a little later maybe. Uh, so this loop, it's going to output the next number. It's going to preserve the AF flag, and it's going to call a fixed delay. Now, this fixed delay is a nested loop. It's two loops, one inside of the other. And it, all it does is waste time, right? It says, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to execute basically nothing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count down from 0100 on DE, and when I hit 0, I'm going to decrement this one time. So it's counting down from 0100 to zero, and then each time it does that, it decrements this one time all the way down to zero. So that gives us a fair amount of time to wait while we let the lights blink. That way we don't just end up with an instant run of the lights. It just looks like they turn on and turn off real quick. We actually have time in between for our human senses to detect the lights changing. So. We preserve these flags, we call the fixed delay, and that's because the fixed delay is going to use the A register a lot. So we want to make sure that whatever we enter this call with in the A register is preserved in the alternate registers, and then we want to restore it back. So then we compare what's in A to FF, the number we're counting to, and if it's the same, it will set the zero flag, but if it's not, the zero flag will not be set. So if it's not zero, it will jump back to the beginning of the loop and continue to count up. Once it reaches 255, it'll exit this loop. It'll turn off the lights. That's what these two lines do. These two lines turn off the lights, and then it'll return. Now we can watch it in action. And here it is in action. That looks pretty bad on camera, actually. The lights are very bright for this camera. But you can see it's counting up in binary. It's going to count all the way up to 255. And then it'll stop and it'll exit. It'll turn off the lights before it exits. You really can't see that on this camera. There we go, and it's done. All right, so next up we wanna blink these lights in C. Now, like I said, we're not gonna blink them, we're just gonna turn them on. I just wanna show you basically uh, how to interact with ports from C because it's a non-standard function call for most operating systems, most development environments, but it's, you know, it's a standard call for Z80 because Z80 has two different addressing modes one for regular memory and one for addressing peripheral devices. So like the out statement in assembly language, we need an out statement in C language and we do have one in high tech C. So let's start with uh, ed led on dot C. All right, so we don't really need any libraries included in this, we're just gonna directly use uh, standard library functions without 
the need for headers. So we'll just go ahead and start our main, void main. Insert some new lines. Okay. Now, what we want to do here is exactly the same thing we just did, except we don't have a delay, and I'm not going to implement a delay this time, and we don't have our um, counting. We're not going to do any counting. We're just going to turn the lights on. So in order to do that, we want to do the same thing. And I'm not going to make variables this time. I'm just going to use magic numbers just to show you quick and easy how this is done. Uh, we, we want to do the out p function, out port presumably. There's a corresponding in p function, port, whatever your port number is. Uh, presumably you would say, you know, var equals uh, in p and then your port number like that, something like that. We're not doing any input, so we just need to do out P and then we're gonna do OXOAO and then OXOF, remember that sets, actually A2, OXOF, that sets us to output a2 is the control port for port A. Is it? Yeah. And then we want to do out P O X A O. That's the data port for port A. O X F F. We just want to turn all the lights on. So 255. All right. Now I've done a mistake here. Let's try that again. Out P O X A two O X O F semicolon. Now there is a way to edit the line without deleting the whole line. Uh, I haven't figured it out yet, so that's part of why I'm not demonstrating how to do this yet. There we go. We need semicolons on both of those. Z, V, O, P. All right. That's our whole program. Just to turn some lights on. And the PIO seems to latch. So once the lights are on, they're on. All right. So let's end that. And then we can compile it. C309. Uh, LED on dot C. This will also take a long time. The smallest programs take a fair amount of time to compile with high tech C, but you know, it's a slightly less than eight megahertz processor, so it makes sense. And this has a fair amount of error checking in it, so if I did make an error, it'll tell me what it is and where it is usually. All right, there we go. Let's try LED on and the lights turn on. I will show you that. All right, here we go. LED on, boom, they all turn on. All right, y'all, I really appreciate y'all watching. I hope it was helpful. I hope that y'all buy these computers and uh, develop software for them because I want your software. All right, thank you so much. Peace.